This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, October 9th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on. And we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Amid ongoing outbreaks of measles and polio, a campaign by the Somali government and international organizations have vaccinated 492,000 children. Soraya Ali has more. At a health center in Mogadishu, Nadir Fusarad Ali is getting her children protected against measles and polio. In Somalia, one in seven children dies before their fifth birthday, and the World Health Organization says many of these deaths could be prevented with vaccines. Now, Nadifa's children are among nearly half a million targeted in a mass immunization campaign amid ongoing outbreaks. All my children are now healthy, so I have no fear even if there is an outbreak, because I know they are vaccinated. UN SOM reports the campaign was started last month in the Benadir region, which surrounds and includes the Somali capital. The area's director of health, Mohamed Mahamoud Adal, said it was prompted by the need to protect children after a recent outbreak of measles, the most severe complications of which include blindness, severe diarrhea and respiratory infections such as pneumonia. The campaign also targeted a strain of polio, different from the wild polio virus which was recently declared eradicated in Africa, that has paralyzed 19 children since late 2017. Mahmoud Shire Mohammed is a polio eradication officer at the WHO. This campaign took place in all the 17 districts of Mogadishu with the aim of reaching out to 492,000 children, which was achieved. We also gave out vitamin A and deworming tablets to boost their immunity and kill parasites. The WHO said the program was complicated by movement restrictions amid the coronavirus pandemic, and thousands of volunteers were deployed to go door to door, encouraging parents to take part. The vaccination was organized by the Federal Ministry of Health with support from the WHO, the UN Children's Fund, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and the Vaccine Alliance, Gavi. Soraya Ali of Reuters with that report. Sunday marks the United Nations annual observance of the International Day of the Girl Child. VO Salem Solomon spoke with Ilwald Elman, who along with her mother, Bartun Aden, are the recipients of the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity for their efforts in providing services to communities affected by the conflict in Somalia. In an excerpt from a one-on-one -on -one interview, Elman describes how her work at the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Somalia is helping women and girls affected by gender-based violence. She explains the beginning of creating a rape crisis center. We saw that the, the human suffering of women and girls was so tolerated was so normalized that it was an open secret in society. Sexual violence was so rampant, particularly in 2010, where there was a massive humanitarian crisis and 350,000 people died. And from all the regions of Somalia, everyone was flocking to Mogadishu for humanitarian aid. So you have mostly women with children in IDP camps and you have military vehicles parked outside, raping women left and right. And there weren't any service centers to support the victims. So that's how our first Rape Crisis Center started. How young were the victims that you were helping? And, and, and what kind of structure was there for you? I mean, it seems like there was a lot of obstacles and also taboo associated with all of that. And so if you can give me an example. There was so much taboo to the point that the president at the time even released a press statement saying that 
rape does not happen in Somalia. Any organization who's speaking about this is bringing shame to the country. Our staff were arrested, harassed. Our centers were shut down. This was just a mere 10 years ago. There was no profile of what a survivor of sexual violence looked like in Somalia then, from a 70-year-old woman to a two-year-old child. Complete impunity. And I feel like of all the work that we've done, whether it's in peace and security, gender-based violence, human rights, education, the one sector that I can actually visibly see change is in this space, gender-based violence. We still have so far to go that we went from a place where you couldn't even talk about it, where there were no services available at all, to now having multiple service providers, where we have from a surge of 11% women in political participation to 24%, where we had the first Minister of Women and Human Rights, where we had this first sexual offenses bill being debated, where we have a conversation that actually acknowledges that this is happening in the country, and now trying to figure out what to do about it, as opposed to denying it. So that is tremendous progress. But uh, we've seen also incidents where action was also taken, uh, but uh, step back with legislation not really addressing it. Yeah. So the very sexual offenses bill that I'm celebrating from 2018 was just a month ago recalled and changed into the intercourse bill, where the sexual offenses bill was trying to persecute rapists and prevent it. The sexual intercourse bill is essentially legalizing sexual violence and legalizing child marriage. It is a major setback. But I feel like we can't move forward unless we recognize where we came from. We're talking about a legal framework right now. Before, we were talking about the same woman being served at our centers three times in a row. The same person, because we keep sending them back to the same environment that's not any more enabling, not any more progressive, not any more safer. But now we're talking about governing this. So we, we still have a very long way to go. That was Somalia's Ilwad Elman speaking to VOA Salem Solomon. The Nobel Peace Prize was announced on Friday, and the winner is the World Food Program, a United Nations agency. It won for its efforts to combat hunger and improve conditions for peace and conflict affected areas. The Rome-based organization says it helps some 97 million people in about 88 countries each year, and that one in nine people worldwide still do not have enough to eat. Chairwoman Berit Rees Anderson of the Norwegian Nobel Committee says the need for international solidarity and multilateral cooperation is more conspicuous than ever. The prize is worth 1.1 million US dollars and will be presented in Oslo, Norway on December 10th. Democratic Republic of Congo's President Felix Shisekedi this week held a virtual regional summit to discuss peace in Africa's Great Lakes region. The summit was attended by Presidents Paul Kagame of Rwanda, Yoweri Museveni of Uganda, and Joao Lorenko of Angola. The leaders reaffirmed their commitment to collaborate in tackling armed groups in North and South Kivu. Among those who met President Shisekedi in Goma was the U.S. Ambassador to the DRC, Mike Hammer. VOA Swahili stringer Oster Malivika sat down for an interview with Ambassador Hammer and asked him about the U.S. relationship with the DRC. Our relations are particularly strong at this moment. Since uh, President Chisikiri assumed office in January 2019 and the establishment of our privileged partnership for peace and prosperity between the United States and Congo in April of 2019, we have been working together to advance President Chisikiri's vision of a Congo uh, free of corruption, of a Congo that no longer tolerates impunity, of a Congo that can attract American investment because there's better security. So I would say in all realms, uh, and uh, we, we cooperate very closely, as, as you well know, we were uh, the biggest donor and uh, supporter in terms of fighting Ebola in the East, and we're very pleased that that uh, epidemic finally was brought to an end in June. And now, of course, we're working together to fight uh, Ebola once again in Equateur, 
and uh, we have uh, provided, again, considerable assistance also in the fight against COVID. Yearly, we provide probably uh, over uh, $500 million in assistance of different types to support development, to support humanitarian needs. And uh, we feel that with this air of change right now that we're feeling in the country that I hear when I travel, that there's great opportunity for the DRC to actually realize its great potential. We should understand uh, the DRC is a very important country in Africa. It has the potential to feed Africa with its resources in agriculture. It has its potential to power Africa with its tremendous uh, hydropower potential. It has a dynamic people that can lead Africa. And what we're trying to do is fight corruption and impunity and open those opportunities for the people of Congo to realize their full potential. That was U.S. Ambassador to the DRC, Mike Hammer, speaking to VOA Swahili stringer, Austria Malibika. Trade Depot, a Lagos-based online marketplace, says gross revenues have risen 300% amid the coronavirus pandemic due to lockdown restrictions disrupting supply chains. Neka Chile has the latest. Forced to weigh in safety against the need to earn a living, Nigerian Kursk owner Fumilaya Kinola found an answer online. Like many across the world, she struggled to replenish her shop amid disrupted supply chains, and mingling in cars to get items herself was not an option. I would, have, I would just lock up my shop because my husband would not allow me to go inside the market to go and be also for goods. Her answer came in the form of Trade Depot, an online marketplace that connects manufacturers and retailers. Akinola now orders via an app with deliveries arriving by vans or tok toks to her narrow kiosk in the frenetic Lagos district of Mushi. We try to help the retailer with data. Trade Depot's chief executive, Onyeka Chizukane, said the model has seen its gross revenue increase 300% in the year to September, compared with 2019. For such a big market, getting your product into retail is a nightmare, right? You're talking about a retail space that is very fragmented, quite a few, you know, several million small stores. After several years of trying to figure this out, we, we kind of saw there was an opportunity to go and do something about this in a, in a, in a bit more structured um, way. Logistic consultant Ikin Nawosu said it's a part of how restrictions are changed in the marketplace. You now have to have physical distribution by motorcycles, so it's creating a new employment chain. It's creating new revenue streams. And that is just scratching the surface of digitization. Fakinola simply means she can keep working without taking greater risk with her health. Neka Chile of Reuters with that report. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, Ghanaian singer Don Sigley talks about his new hit single, Gun Gun Lelgu. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. 
right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. The U.S. vice presidential debate between Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris highlighted differences between their approaches on foreign policy and America's role in the world. The two candidates debated whether President Donald Trump or Democratic nominee Joe Biden would do a better job addressing challenges by U.S. rival China and its longtime adversary, Iran. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara reports. The coronavirus has dominated American politics in recent months, but in this week's vice presidential debate, Vice President Mike Pence and his Democratic opponent, Senator Kamala Harris, argued their view of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and China, issues that have had less focus in the campaign so far. Pence highlighted the recent Abraham Accords that normalized Israel's relations with United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. He said the administration subdued Iran by assassinating its chief military strategist Qasem Soleimani and defeated ISIS. President Trump unleashed the American military and our armed forces destroyed the ISIS caliphate and took down their leader al-Baghdadi without one American casualty. Kamala Harris said America is less safe because of Trump's unilateral approach to foreign policy. Citing the administration's 2018 withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal achieved in 2015 with allies' support. What we have seen with Donald Trump is that he has betrayed our friends and, 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 and embraced dictators around the world. The Iran nuclear deal is a key difference between Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden with Biden promising to return to it immediately if elected. That would put Israel and some of the other U.S. allies in the region, the Persian Gulf region, countries like Saudi Arabia, they would then be on the defensive, and that would be a challenge. But I, I'm, I'm not at this point convinced that that would create a rupture in U.S. Uh, Israel relations, or for that matter, U.S.-Saudi relations. Yeah, Pence slammed Biden for being a cheerleader for communist China. He said the administration wants to improve relations with Beijing, but that Trump will also hold China accountable for the pandemic. China and the World Health Organization do not play straight with the American people. Harris accused Trump of hurting American jobs and economy because of his trade war with China. She cited recent global opinion polls by Pew Research that indicated U.S. allies now respect China's Xi Jinping more than they do Donald Trump. This is where we are today because of a failure of leadership by this administration. The Pence-Harris debate outlined a difference in foreign policy between Trump's America First doctrine and Biden's multilateral approach. If elected, Biden has promised he would return the U.S. to leadership roles in international organizations like the World Trade Organization and Trans-Pacific Partnership to contain adversaries including China. That, I think, would produce less uncertainty in the U.S.-China relationship. I think the nature of the relationship, fundamentally contentious and adversarial, would be the same in a second Trump term or in a Biden term. While foreign policy is usually not at the forefront of voters' minds, one important issue this year is standing up for Israel, which matters to a key group of Trump supporters, evangelical Christians who made up about a third of Trump's backers in 2016. Both Trump and Biden have pledged continuous support for Israel. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. While U.S. President Donald Trump has slipped in recent national polls, he retains core backing in much of America's farm country, where new trade pacts and massive government assistance for the agricultural sector are popular. As VOS Ken Farabar reports, along with the coronavirus pandemic, aid and trade are on the minds of many farmers as they prepare to vote in the November 3rd contest between Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. Earlier this year, Ron Moore was preparing for another year of trade uncertainty with China, one of the largest purchasers of the soybeans he grows on his rural Illinois farm. But what he didn't see coming was a global coronavirus pandemic that rattled the food supply chain, pushing down wholesale prices for livestock and the foodstuffs they consume. 
that decimated the demand for the grains that provide the feed for the livestock. The U.S. Department of Agriculture reports amid the trade war, soybean prices fell 35 percent between 2014 and 2019, even before the pandemic reduced Chinese purchases further. It was a double whammy, so to speak. Prices for corn, one of the key crops on Wendell Shaman's farm, fell 44 percent between 2014 and 2019. He hasn't seen a significant rebound. It's been a pretty ugly year price-wise. Most of what I sold was way below what I'd hoped for. Which is why both Moore and Shaman say the U.S. Department of Agriculture's market facilitation program payments to farmers since 2018 kept them afloat as the Trump administration negotiated new trade deals. But it was certainly a big help. I'm sure there are, there are people that wouldn't have had anything to eat if it didn't happen. It gives us a lifeline. We're still trading water. We need more profitability, more better, uh, better markets for us to get out of the water and be up on dry land. The USDA unveiled a $19 billion aid package earlier this year as the pandemic constricted the nation's food supply. Another round of $14 billion in agricultural assistance followed in September. Illinois Farm Bureau's National Legislative Director Adam Nielsen says government spending totaling nearly $100 billion since 2016 had a positive impact. We've been able to stem the tide of uh, farm bankruptcies. Farmers, while they haven't been uh, spending extravagantly, have been able to pay for uh, feed, seed, and fertilizer to get another crop in the ground. While Wendell Shaman says government aid on that scale can't continue forever. There's not enough money for the government to just keep giving everybody a, a living. That just doesn't work. He nevertheless credits President Trump for progress on trade issues and hopes America forges a permanent agreement with China. The way he's treated farmers and kept us going, that didn't have to happen. It's pretty surprising for a guy that's got a New York history, knows very little about agriculture, to, to be as supportive of agriculture. I like what he's done. I don't like the way he talks sometimes. I get frustrated with that. You, you could have some better manners. Hey, man. Which is why Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden's message of bipartisan cooperation also resonates with Shaman. You've got to have compromise. You've got to have people working together. What Shaman doesn't like are what he perceives as demands to completely overhaul the U.S. economy to combat climate change. I haven't heard anybody talking about a battery-driven tractor yet. What am I going to plant with? The talk just seems so often seems nonsensical to me. A late September poll of rural Americans showed President Trump with a 17-point lead over Biden. In the same poll, 59% of farmers said they would be struggling financially without the USDA's market facilitation program and the coronavirus food assistance program. Regardless of some of the outcomes or how people want to look at it, I think President Trump has, you know, focused attention on rural America where maybe that hasn't been the case in quite a few years. Trump's popularity in rural areas endures at a time when the president's national poll numbers have dipped. While many Illinois farmers voice support for Trump, the most recent statewide poll, including America's third largest city, Chicago, gives Biden a commanding 25-point lead, 61% to 36%. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Roseville, Illinois. It's time for our entertainment report and a little fun to send you off into your weekend. VOA's Heather Maxwell connects virtually with Ghanaian singer Don Sigley to share his new hit single, Gun Gun Lelgu. One of Northern Ghana's most popular singers, Don Sigley, has just released a brand new single and a music video. Now, we have Don with us virtually from Tamale, Ghana, to talk about the song, what it's all about, and why his fans are going crazy over it. Don, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good, how are you? I'm fine. So Don, we're gonna watch a minute or so of your music video, and then we'll come back and talk about why it's uh, just killing it up there in the North, okay? Sure, let's do that. So Don, what is this song all about? 
the title of this particular song is uh, Gobo Nelgo. And it's all about, uh, you know, money. I pray to God that he blesses us with a lot of money. And if he is going to bless us, he should bless us with the money that will stay with us and not the Gongo Nelgo type, the short-lived type, you know. <laughs> I yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's Google Nelgo for you. Know? Okay. <laughs> Let's watch some more. So, quick question, Don. What does Lafu mean? I hear Lafu, Lafu. What is that? Yeah. So, uh, Lafu is in my uh, local dialect, which means uh, I'm praying. Like, Lafu, ye, Lafu, ya, Nduma, Tante, Lafu. <laughs> money. Yeah, God, please bless us with uh, money. And if you are going to bless us with the money, bless us with the money that will stay with us and not the Gungu Nelgo type. Gungu Nelgo type, uh, Gungu Nelgo doesn't stay with us for long. No it's good. Short lived. Uh -huh, so that is. Uh, <laughs> As I explained earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the man with no shirt dancing and showing his jiggle? I love that, but who is this? <laughs> we call him Ibu Ghana. Yes, he's one of uh, the renowned actors and comedians uh, who are based in the northern part of Ghana. Yeah. So, Don, why do you think fans love this song so much? I mean, there are so many little selfie videos of different people men women old young dancing singing along it's amazing one reason why i think uh, people are falling in love with this particular song is also the way it is being presented the message is too catchy you know and when people whoever understands the language when you listen to the uh, to the song you you would actually appreciate what i'm saying can you describe one or two things that you say specifically that that really resonate with people I said, Dala Mambo, it's a question. So is this me? Take a look outside my house. So I have love like this. People uh, actually love me like this. And I couldn't see this simply because I was not rich. Are you critiquing people who love other yeah. people for their money? Or are you just saying it's a fact of life? When you have money, people come to you. They're drawn to you. It's a fact. Whether you are a child like, uh, or uh, if you are an adult, or a teenager or a, 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 even a baby. Trust me, if you have money, people love you. <laughs> even a baby, huh? <laughs> even a baby. Everybody would love to pick you. Hey, yeah. baby, baby. Don Sibley, thank you so much. That was Heather Maxwell with Ghanaian singer Don Sigley and his new hit single, Gungun Lelgu. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.